rain for 40 days and 40 nights. And the scattering of the people, Lawson, well, what happened to the scattering of the people? What did they do? They tried to do what? They got their language switched up. That's right. Now, what about the patriarchs, friend? What, who was one of our patriarchs? Who was the patriarchs? They were leading the, the leading what was going to be God's people. It started with the patriarchs. The family leaders. There was some men. What was one of them?
two books of the Bible for the return and reveal really talk about it a whole lot. There's Ezra and, and Nehemiah. And then we have the Avery. We have the 400 years of silence. Now what happened during that time period?
body that is sick uh, be better and please help everybody that is crippled get better in Jesus name amen I'd like to welcome you all to our service this evening. We're going to begin by singing number 22. That's 22 in the big book, number 22.
Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for all the wonderful blessings that you've blessed us with. We're thankful that we have been able to come out today and study another portion of your word and sing songs and praise unto you. And We're thankful that we come out tonight and we come to do nothing other than to worship you and to edify one another and build each other up. We pray that you will be with Matt here in just a moment as he delivers us a lesson that we will uh, find it to be the truth and that we can put it in our daily lives. We pray that you will be with the sick of our number, that you will be with uh, Bob Brooks and Wanda Woodfin, that you would be with uh, Jimmy Wells and others that are on our hearts and minds that need uh, your healing hand. We pray that you will be with them. We pray for the ones that has lost loved ones, that you will comfort them in a way that only you can. Father, I pray that you will help each one of us to um, encourage one another and that we can uh, know our brothers and sisters in Christ and that we can help share their burdens. And uh, It's not as heavy whenever there's people carrying the load with you. And we need to realize that, and there's no reason for us to go through things alone, even though sometimes we do. And I pray that you will be with those people and that you will help them in the mountains that they're climbing. Father, I pray uh, a Thanksgiving prayer for each and every person here, and I pray that you will help them and that we can all be soldiers of yours. Father, I pray that you will forgive us of our sins, and in your Son's most high and holy name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Song for our lesson this uh, evening will be number 25 from the Supper. Number 25. <coughs> number 390.
Good evening. If you have your Bibles, you may turn to Mark chapter 8. and We'll be again reading there. Verse 14 says, Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you, do you not yet perceive and understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes you do not see, and having ears do you not hear, and do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, Twelve. And the seven for the four thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, Seven. And he said to them, Do you not yet understand? We are glad that you're here this evening and able to be with us and, and we can spend some time worshiping God and studying a portion of His Word to help us live our lives. And when reading this verse here and trying to say this last verse, in verse 21, and trying to see how do we live our lives, the question that Jesus asked His disciples is, do you not yet understand? And if you read verses 14 through 21, just as we did, and, and you read only that, and then you get this question, do you not yet understand? And, and maybe you're reading this, reading what's happening with the disciples and with Jesus, and part of you goes, man, y'all don't get it yet, do you? And then, maybe if you're like me, you go, I don't know what in the world he's talking about either. <laughs> what's he trying to say? Uh, do you not understand? You know, that question gets asked a lot uh, by parents to kids. I, I know I find myself asking this question repeated, repeatedly, day in, day out, sometimes multiple times a day. Uh, it may have different variations. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying to you? Do, do you not get it? What I, I can explain it to you, but I can't understand it for you. I, get, I say that one a lot, too. Uh, what is it that, that you don't get? Maybe that's the way you word it. But this idea of do you not understand was one that we can relate to as far as asking other people, but when it's asked to us and we put ourselves in the boat with the disciples, do, do we understand what Jesus is teaching? Do we understand what He's saying? In, in the first few verses of Mark chapter 8, it is the recording of Jesus Feeding the 4,000. And if you flip back to chapter 6, it is where Jesus has fed the 5,000. And he recalls this to them in the passage of which we read. What about these two different instances? He said, well, when, when I fed the 5,000, how many baskets did you pick up? They said, 12. When I fed the 4,000, how many baskets did you pick up? They said, 7. And so... Jesus is trying to remind them, you know, in the first few verses here, in the preceding events up until when they get in this boat, Jesus has done the feeding. Jesus has been feeding the multitudes. And, and when they got the 4,000 fed, <coughs> they, they feed the 4,000, and they had gone across the lake and they feed the 4,000, and all these people are here, and they, they go back across the lake, go to a different place, and the Pharisees begin to hound Jesus. And they begin to ask him questions, question who he is and what he's thinking in verses 11 through 13. They asked him for a sign from heaven. And he says, well, you're not going to, this, this generation is not going to get a sign any different than the sign of Noah. So, so then what does he do? He, he goes and leaves and goes to the other side of the boat again. He goes to the other side again. And this is where all this takes place. So they've been back and forth across the sea. And once they have done so, once they have done so, they've gone from feeding the 4,000, they got all them extra baskets, they got them seven extra baskets. They go across the sea, they go over there to the Pharisees. They, well, we're not going to stay here. We're going to go back across. And while they're in the boat, they go, well, we ain't got but one loaf. We ain't got but one loaf of bread. I don't know how many's in the boat. 
I don't, I don't know if, if, if they were at Matt's capacity. I don't know if all 12 of the disciples, I kind of figure it's at least the 12 disciples and Jesus, but nothing really directly says that. Well, it, it could have been the 12 disciples, Jesus, uh, and some more folks. But nonetheless, if it was more than two folks, one loaf is not going to quite cut it. And I think the disciples and, and me have a lot in common, especially in this moment, because it's this moment of realization that, you know what, we should have, take all, we should have took all them <laughs> seven extra baskets with us. And I don't know what I don't know if they took all seven of them with them and they ate them on the, on the way across or if they left them, but they only had one loaf. And Jesus says, y'all, you are still focused on right here, right now, and in this moment. If you think back to when they fed the 5,000, what, what, whatever we're going to do, send these people to town, they're going to get something to eat. And he said, well, you feed them what you got. And he's like, we ain't, barely, we ain't got nothing. We got one little kid that brought a lunchbox. That's all we got. And then here they are with the 4,000. We, we ain't got very much again. We got just a few fish and we got some bread. We ain't got a whole lot here either. <clears throat> you see, they, they, they begin to think about right here and right now and in those moments when they even feeding the 4,000, they're like, we ain't got enough for everybody. And so he proves them time and time again. He's proved it with them with 5,000 people, 4,000 people, and now he's got, let's say, 15 on a boat. And they ain't got but one loaf. And, and, and here they are. They, they're, they're consumed with the thing right there in front of them. And then he begins on this leaven of the Pharisees and leaven of Herod. If you read Matthew's account, he talks about the leaven of the Sadducees. The leaven of the people who were trying to be more liberal, if you will, in their interpretation of doing the will of God trying to please Herod and the Herodians and also themselves and please God all at the same time. He's, he's, he's saying, y'all are getting focused on the wrong things, just like they're getting focused on the wrong things. That leaven of the Pharisees, that leaven of Herod is starting to infiltrate your lives to where you're not thinking about godly things anymore. You're thinking about right here and right now and in this moment, what do I got to have to satisfy myself in this moment? And we are much the same way. The disciples were that way time and time again. When, when Jesus was walking on the water, they were overcome. When, when he was asleep in the boat, they were overcome with the here and now. And here and now, they are focused on the here and now with just one loaf. They were living only for the moment in which they resided and had forgotten everything that happened before. And Jesus asked them this question, do you not understand? And when we think about our lives, and we think about the things that we face, are we like the disciples, or are we more like what he wants them and he's trying to get them to become? Let's look at a few things that Jesus points out here in this passage. It first talks about the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Now, we talk, I spoke about this, and, it, and if we think about what leaven is and what leaven does, in comparison to the meal, the flour, the, the things that are in the recipe, the amount of leaven that is used is very little. And, and when we think about what is said in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Well, well we're aware of that. We understand that. We know that. And so he gives the church at Corinth this encouragement, cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you are really unleavened for Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. So it is this idea here that this leaven or these evil influences, while they are very small, they may be minute, they will go and they will spread. And it will take over the whole lump. It, will, it doesn't just stay in part of the lump. When you put that leaven in with the dough, <clears throat> it doesn't stay in one spot. It, it spreads throughout the clump. 
And it causes the whole thing to rise and to become leaven. And when speaking about the leaven specifically of the Pharisees, in, in Luke chapter 12, at the end of verse 1 he says, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. You know, when we, when we oftentimes try to decipher things about what is their leaven, you know, we may open up all kinds of commentaries and not open the Bible. He is very direct here in Luke regarding the Pharisees and the leaven that they had, which was hypocrisy. And the problem with that is that they were going around being one thing for show and awe of all of the people that were trying to worship God. And on the inside, they had not the love of God in their hearts. And that was growing amongst the people. The people themselves were beginning to act much the same way. They, they didn't have the love of God in their hearts. Well, if we just do stuff to get these Pharisees off my case, if I can just do that long enough to keep my wife happy, if I can just do that long enough to keep my husband happy, if I can do that long enough for the people in Bible class, we'll, we'll get off my case, I'll do that. You see how quickly the leaven goes throughout the masses. And that's why Paul tells his church at Corinth, you've got to get it out. <clears throat> you've got to get rid of the leaven. Any kind of evil influences, it will take over and run like wildfire. The Herodians, the Sadducees, and the leaven of Herod was that of a worldly nature. Materialism worldliness and the idea of compromising with the world what was the nature of Herod's living. Well, you know, I, I could do the Jews a favor and then that would make them happy and they'd kind of settle down and act right for a little while and then that might make everything a little better for me and, and Pilate and the Roman government. We can just kind of get all these things set of that right here because I like to have everything in Jerusalem in order so that I've got everything in control so I can might move up the ladder. But that, that dare wouldn't be us, would it? We, we wouldn't dare be worried about material possessions and things. We wouldn't be worried about what the world says or the way that the world views us. And, and we wouldn't be concerned about compromising with the world so that we don't offend anybody. Well, if the warning was given to the disciples of Jesus to beware and to watch out for, I surely know that it's meant for us too. Because I feel like I'm probably not the only one here that's battling the same leaven of Herod even today. In James chapter 4 and verse 4, You adulterous people, do you not know that the friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You know, we, we think about this a lot of times when we think about the words of Jesus. And he says, you will love one and you will hate the other. You can't serve those two masters. If you're going to be with the world, you're going to be an enemy of God. <clears throat> you're going to be split apart from God. The thing that we must remember to help us maintain this separation, if you will, from the world while still having to be in it. It's what is said in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11 when it talks about us being strangers and pilgrims here on this earth. This is not our home. And, and, and so many times we're like those disciples in that boat focused on that one loaf when this is not our permanent destination and when we are able to maintain that focus of not what's in the boat and where but where the boat is going well then that one loaf really doesn't seem to make that big of a deal I got to thinking about this what is the one thing that will stop leaven from working what's well, when you actually stick it in the oven. 
You know, you don't stick it in the oven and then it browns up and it turns into bread. And then it's like, well, I set it on the counter and then three days later it's the size of the kitchen. <laughs> it don't work that way. Once you have exposed it to that heat and it is now cooked and baked out, it stops that bacterial growth, if you will, and it is no more. This leaven will stop growing one day. This leaven will cease its expansion when it is, when it is exposed to extreme heat. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in that leaven when that happens. So we had better remove that leaven and become as God would have us to be today. See, those disciples, they're so confused about all of the things that are happening because they're focused on the material and the physical nature of this world. <clears throat> they begin to misunderstand what he is teaching to them. So Jesus has told them and said to them, uh, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And they said in verse 16, It is because we have no bread. That's why he's telling us this. They, they, they go, Oh, you know, we, we left all them baskets over there on the other side. We didn't been to three other places. And now we're hungry. They think, Well, is he rebuking us because we didn't bring any bread? Is he telling us not to buy bread from the Pharisees? You know, we'd get over there and we'd be hungry and we'd be asking the Pharisees for food. Or, 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 the, or we'd be asking Herod's followers for food. You know, we'd be asking the Sadducees and Herod's sympathizers for food. And maybe that's what he's trying to teach us. Is, is Jesus saying that we should have no fellowship with the Pharisees and the Herodians? Is that what he's trying to tell us? You see, their minds, much like ours, was everywhere. When it, when it goes about it, it's really none of these things that he's trying to get them to think about and to realize. He's just trying to get them to see that leaven is this, simply a metaphor for anything that is evil and, and specifically with the Pharisees that is hypocrisy. But sometimes we're not able to see that just like they're not able to see that because we're focused in, in our day-to-day -day lives outside of Maybe four hours a week, we spend 164 hours less sleep out and amongst the world. And it's so easy for us to be filled with those things that we oftentimes are just like these people and we are just spiritual dullards. We're just boneheaded. We fall short. We're not thinking that way. We continue to struggle with the flesh because... That's what's affecting us every day, day in, day out. You know, it, it, it's, well, we're under spiritual attack. I know, but it, 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 at least my, my leg don't hurt when it happens. You know, we, we think about things, well, it's not impacting me right here and right now and in this moment. Yeah, I know that's a tough problem for them in New York or Lexington or in California. That's a tough issue for them in Mexico. Or I feel sorry for them people in India, but, you know, it's not affecting me because I got bread. And it slowly, well, at least it's not, you know, it might be happening in Athens, but it ain't none of my people. Well, I know it happens in this county, and I know, I know there are bad things that happen, and I know that they ain't preaching right, and they're not talking right, and I know they don't act right. But at least it's not anybody in my family, and then the next thing you know, it, it is. We have to be focused continually, not that on the material or physical nature of things, but that of the spiritual. Because when our heart is not right, the whole body will be wrong. It will be filled full of evil. Well, how does that begin? Well, sometimes it begins here in our worship service. <clears throat> we, we think about the things that happen, and, and, and we think about uh, the, us being together and, and worshiping uh, God. And, and do we focus on even worshiping God, or do we focus on... What am I getting out of it myself? Well, you ought to go to this church over here, man. They, they, I, I've never left feeling bad over here. And, and I think about uh, what Brother Robert was speaking about this morning. Well, what have you put into it, you know? 
If you, I never get anything out of Bible class. I hadn't done a lesson in four years. But I mean, I, I don't ever get nothing out of it. People sometimes will complain about the songs that we should have sang, and then, then we complain about, about the song that we did sing. Uh, well, here comes the prayer time. wonder what they're going to talk about. What are they going to pray for? I hope my kid doesn't scream during that time. That would be nice for once. That would be a nice change of pace. Man, that guy's speaking again. He sure is going long. We got the Oscars tonight, and I don't, I don't want to, Is it the Oscars tonight? I thought that's what it was, but I didn't ever go back and check it. But the Emmys or something, I don't know. Oscar was that guy on uh, Sesame Street. That was the only one I remember. Then we're done. That's how quick we can be done. I don't know. <laughs> the disciples never seemed to get it. They were so focused on the material world that they failed to see the spiritual work of God in their midst. They were there. The Pharisees wanted a sign. And the disciples had been there when he fed 5,000, when they fed 4,000, when he was in control. And then they're like, oh, what, what are we going to do? They went into this panic thing. And many times, just like the disciples forgot, sometimes we forget too. We forget what God's done. We forget the things that he has done. The disciples were there amongst all those miracles, but like the Pharisees, seeing they yet refused to believe. Even though it was right in front of them, the evidence was laid out. Here it is, in your face. They refuse to believe. And it's one thing for unbelievers like the Pharisees to fail to see and believe. Their hearts were hardened. They, they, did, they didn't understand. They didn't seek to understand. They, seek, they sought out to prove him wrong. They weren't seeking to understand or to believe. But another thing for those who claim to know and love the Lord to fail to see his power and believe him for their needs. <clears throat> they were so worried about one loaf of bread. D didn't they know that Jesus could take that one loaf and feed all of them if he can take, you know, five and feed 5,000? And have even more left over than what they started with. Did they not understand that? No, they didn't. And sometimes we don't either. As John said at the end of his book, you know, all of these things were written that you may believe. That you, that you might believe and that you could understand who he was. And if I was to write everything down, it couldn't be contained in the whole wide world. Nothing could contain all of the works and the wonders that he did. And yet you still don't believe. And there were those people that were there watching Jesus do all, this, all these things that they didn't believe. And there were his disciples who were supposed to be following him. And they had forgotten all the things that he had done. So it's almost as if the Lord challenges the disciples. As he was saying, having eyes do you not see, having ears do you not hear, and do you not remember... Do you not remember the five loaves fed 5,000 and they, how many baskets were left? Twelve. And he said, I broke seven for the four thousands. And how many were left? He said, seven. He was saying these baskets should have been a reminder for you. <clears throat> these baskets should have made you recall. You know, every time you walk through your house and you see a basket, you should have been thinking, I remember when Jesus filled up 12 of them after he fed everybody. I remember when Jesus filled up seven. Oh, man, it, it was, it, them baskets were bigger. The baskets he filled up were bigger than those. Do you remember that? And they've forgotten his power. How frustrated Jesus, rightfully so, would have been frustrated at that very moment. But are we much different? Do we not forget? Having seen his wonders and having seen his beauty and having seen his grand design and his plan and things come true that he had promised. And we go, we become focused on the one thing in our lives 
that we feel like is the greatest threat to our longevity. And, and we, we just become overwhelmed because the milk was spilled on the counter or whatever it might be. And, and it's and in the realm of things spiritually, it's not much more than a little bit of milk spilt on the counter. But that becomes what we focus on because we're focused on the here and now and the worldly things, the material things, instead of the, the righteous things. Sometimes we need to stop in the middle of what we're doing, spend time alone, reflect and remember what he has done. Remembering, as it were, a memorial. Joshua chapter 4, the memorial was set up for the children of Israel as they were in the invasion and conquest. We talked about our kids, Clyde. We, they, they cross in over this Jordan River on, on dry ground. And in verse 21, he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall tell your ch shall let your children know Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord our God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty that you may fear the Lord your God forever. They had taken 12 stones and set them up at the crossing, at the Jordan River. And then when anyone would come by, or the children would go down to skip rocks down at the river, and they would look and they would go, Daddy, what's that, what's that pillar for? What's that memorial for? What, why are those rocks stacked up like that? And he would go, well, let me tell you what God did. He didn't do it just here at the Jordan River. He didn't do it just at the Red Sea. Let me tell you what God did then. Let me tell you what He's done now. And I'm not saying that we need to make a grave image and we need to have something up in our house, but we need to establish memorials that we can reflect and that we can talk about and that we ourselves, lest we forget, we can remember what God has done. Lest we be like the disciples in the boat and forget everything that He has established. The Lord's Supper is a memorial for the first day of the week. We do it every first day of the week. This was an established memorial by Christ Himself with the bread and the fruit of the vine. And do we talk to others about if, if they're here, well, what are y'all doing? Well, we've got, this is what we're doing. This is our memorial feast to remember the sacrifice of Jesus, to remember the blood that was shed that I have been cleansed by, to remember that He has risen from the dead, to remember that because of that sacrifice, I am justified before God. What about for answered prayers? You know, sometimes we, we'll pray, we'll pray, we'll pray, we'll write it, we'll write down what we're praying about, and we'll focus on it, we'll pray about it, and God answers the prayer, and we forgot all about it. We don't go back, and we don't write down how He answered our prayer, and He did it on this date, and how great and how powerful He was, and how amazing it came through. We remember all the time about what we asked for, but so many times we forget about when He actually granted it. What about lost ones redeemed? What about those, those that, that were lost in the world and they, there they were, they were living for Satan and they returned? Do we remember? Do we set up and go, you know, praise God for what He has done? Praise God that He brought them back, that they were brought back. Do we rejoice over that? Do we remember that? And so many times we look at things and we're like, I tried talking to them, I tried talking to them, I went to them, I went to them, went to them. nothing ever happened. And then just one day they showed up and started living right. And you forgot that? Sometimes we just have to stop, reflect, and think about the ways that we have been blessed. And remembering the things that He gave to us when we were undeserving 
He blessed us when we weren't even thinking about asking for something. Revelation chapter 2, verses 4 and 5 reminds us that we should remember the love that we first had. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first words or else I will come to you quickly and remove the lampstand from its, from its place unless you repent. We need to remember these things. We need to set these up. We need to talk about them. Children of Israel had stones sitting by the river. What do we have? We have the Lord's Supper. We have this memorial. We need to pause, reflect, and remember everything He's done. And when we remember that, we are revived. Because you can't help but be. Because you live all over again the moment in which He brought His love down to you. The disciples had forgotten. Oh, how soon we forget when we do not understand. Do you not understand? The what ifs, the how's he going to do that, that plagued the disciples trying to solve a loaf mystery in the boat. Well, what if we cut it up like this? Can we do squares or rectangles or triangles? How can we get the most out of this? I don't understand. I don't know. Well, we're kind of lost right here, and there's Jesus in the boat. I think about that too when they when the storm was raging, and they were, "Do you care not that we perish, Master? The tempest rage. Do you carest thou not that we perish? How can you lie asleep?" It's like, well, why are we all worried about that if he was on a boat with you? Why do I think oftentimes, why do we worry about the things if we're really walking with Jesus? Well, the, the thing is, is, is so many times we're not really walking with Jesus. And we're out there on our own. The same issues, those halt our progress and our growth, growth in the kingdom because we forget that we, we're trying to do it our own and we don't have him with us. You see, they had the bread of life with them. And that was growing and sustaining them, and they forgot it. And he said, do you not understand that I'm the bread of life? I will help you. I will sustain you. I will grow you. I will make you into what I need you to be. <clears throat> he is our need meter. He is the one who meets all our needs. And when we understand this, and we trust this, and we are not swayed by worldly things, then we truly are His. Because our answer to everything is truly what would he do? Now if you're here and you're not living with him, well I understand why you're so overwhelmed and why you're so focused on one loaf. Because you don't have the big picture. Because we like the disciples do not understand. So the solution to that is realize the one who is guiding the boat Jesus Christ and trusting Him and walking with Him every step of your life. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, please come as we stand and as we sing.
take the Lord's Supper. Raise ready? your hand at this time. I don't see anyone. Again, we appreciate everyone being here this evening. Let's all remember to be back Wednesday evening for our midweek Bible study. That's at 7 o'clock this coming Wednesday. Closing song will be number 383. We'll sing the first and last verse, after which Brother Robert lead us in our closing prayer. Let's all stand as we <clears throat> so let's all stand as we sing this song, please. I have a home prepared where the saints have I just over in the glory land. And I long to be by my Savior's side just over in the glory land. Just over, over in the glory land. and those that are grieving the loss of loved ones even in times past. And we pray, Father, that you'll put your healing hand on them, give them your peace and your comfort, and use each of us to be an encouragement to one another. Go with us as we separate from here tonight and help us to live for you and to be more what you want us to be. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.